and here we are for the Profit Flywheel. So every Friday, we do Flywheel Friday. And when we have free time, when it allows, when the schedule clears up, we use Mondays to hit Flywheel Friday. And if you've been here before, you know how it goes. One, um, I never have control of my slides. They just do whatever they want to do. Two, uh, we're always operating under an assumption. And the assumption is you have priorities other than uh, running your business, meaning you don't just want to grow your business so you can spend your days running your business. Uh, if that is you, that's great. A lot of this stuff is not going to apply because uh, what we're always talking about is getting closer to the things that actually matter to you, meaning your business is serving some purpose, uh, buying you more free time to spend with your family, paying for your kid's college. Uh, it could be altruistic. Who, Whatever your priorities are, your priorities, no judgment here. Uh, but we're, we're assuming that you have priorities other than uh, just have a bigger business. Uh, again, assumption is that bigger business represents something in your life. You can always join us live, ProfitFlywheel.com. We're live every Friday. Uh, if we get a wild hair and want to go live on a random Thursday night, we will email the people that have registered at ProfitFlywheel.com. So if you want to catch these, uh, we share the replays sometimes, sometimes we don't, sometimes we forget to record, sometimes we have guests that share private information so we don't share recordings. Um, so I suggest that if you can be live, uh, you be live. We also always try to do Q&A. Um, and there we go. ProfitFlywheel.com. We are talking about four things in particular, cash flow engineering, uh, customers for life, revenue multiplication, and get cash now. I'm skimming over those because we break them down in detail in different, um, different areas of the website. If you go to Wealth q and if you go to cfeclass.com, you can see what these things are. But these are the components of the flywheel. How do we get closer to the things that actually matter to us? Engineer cash flows, uh, increase revenues, and then multiply revenue by adding new streams of income and uh, always hedging and building what we call ACE cards. Uh, stuff I used to do intuitively, Dan has built phenomenal workbooks for, so we always have, uh, in case of emergency, break glass. We always have those things laying around. Okay. And the question is, um, should I do a thing? Which thing should I do next? And I think the macro question, which Dan always articulates so well, is am I going to be okay? That, that's uh, uh, Dan said it a million times, and it's the same. It's, it's really why we're getting up every day and doing whatever we do to make sure that uh, we're going to be okay and we're going to get to where we want to go. So today what I want to do, sprung this on Dan this morning, um, did not know this was coming. He might be tired of talking about it. But there's a thing called, or I've been calling it the hidden wealth lever. I saw him present it one time. And to me, it is just one of those things that highlights the importance of the cash flow engineering, the tax optimization, all the stuff we talk about. It's also immediately something we can all implement immediately, which I did. And now there's a testimonial, there's a video of me floating around after I implemented it because I was so uh, jazzed on it. So we call it the hidden wealth lever. It's just a, a few quick things you can do. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about later about the, um, the idea that like you're going to see this, uh, Dan's going to explain it and you're going to say, wow, that's awesome. That changes my life. Uh, that's going to have a huge impact. And you might find yourself five, six, seven months from now still thinking that never have implemented it. So we're going to talk a little bit at the end about um, how to actually get this stuff done. Okay. So Dan, uh, Will you do me a favor and just jam for a minute on cash flow? Because I think when we say increase cash flow, everybody's mind immediately goes to more sales. And the way that you explain it and talk about it is a little bit different. So if you want to break down our definition of, of cash flow as we're using it here. Yeah, so at maybe the most rudimentary level, uh, an increase in, in cash flow would be your bank account balance actually going up at the kind of most, most basic level. And uh, over an extended period of time, if you just look at it today or tomorrow, sample size of one day or two days, it may, it may go up. Um, 
we're talking that could just be happenstance because bills have not not um, hit your hit your bank account yet uh, but really what we're talking about is is your is your cash over overall cash position increasing and so there are a few components to it uh, in terms of thinking about your overall cash position increasing there is like I said at the most rudimentary level your your bank account but there are other components to it as well in the sense of what happened to your outstanding accounts receivable and accounts payable how, how are those how are those changing over time and as well as are you taking on more debt or are you paying down debt so your bank account may go up but in the process of your bank account going up your accounts payable the amount that you owe your vendors have increased as well as maybe you you borrowed some debt so using the the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, is an example. So a number of folks got hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, I don't know the final tally, of businesses got this, this loan that's supposed to be forgivable and the, the rules have, have uh, continued to change. Uh, but when, when the, the loan was funded, it got uh, pushed into your bank account, so now your balance has gone up. But if that loan doesn't end up getting forgiven, you're not necessarily in a better cash position because you got to pay it off. Right? You got to pay back the debt. So when you when so at the most rudimentary level is your bank account balance going up. But if you expand it, you need to look at the other aspects of your balance sheet. So your assets and liabilities, and equity position to go. Well, is it is it going up because of profits? Or is it actually going up because I didn't pay people and I borrowed? So uh, really what we're trying to do is have our bank account balance go up, uh, but not have our outstanding AP, our accounts payable go up and not take on more debt, right? Because as that stuff goes up, your credit card balances are going up, your uh, lines of credit are going up, your vendors, um, your potentially actually in a worse off position uh, because you're just looking at one singular account. So uh, in reality, we want to see bank account balances go up, liabilities going down. Perfect. And how many, um, I know we, we, we kind of beat this to death. How often does a business owner um, assume they're in the best position they've ever been in because they just made the most sales they've ever made? And uh, after a quick glance, you can, you say to them, uh, yeah, actually, you're not really in a better position. Yeah, I think I've shared the, the, the story of a number of months back, four or five months back, uh, this pre, pre-COVID, there was a, a, a business that hit 30 million in sales, and they've been trying to get the number for years. This company's been around for, for a long time, it's a product-based business, and so they had their highest revenue month or highest revenue year and uh, they had the most amount of profits and they were in the worst position they'd ever been in because in order to produce all of that they took on a lot of additional fixed costs uh, and uh, they didn't have the same level of committed revenues their product they sell products to uh, consumers to uh, so it's not a it's not a b2b product business it's uh, where they're getting signed contracts. It's, they're selling products to consumers. There's no commitment for them to continue to buy the product. So in order to get the results that they had, they took on a lot of additional risks uh, and, and also took on some additional debt to finance all of that. So now they've stacked the deck in a way that for them to be in the same position that they were in the previous year to have to match their profits, they had to have more in sales, like 35 million in sales, because they added all these additional fixed costs to their business. So their overall run rate had gone up. I said, you for that story, just to throw some stones at the sales cures everything crowd that might be um, sitting around. Sales are important, but the sales cure everything crowd can cause a lot of problems. Uh, so I just want to touch on this real quick um, because I, I, we're going to talk about it again, but you know, I love my barbells. Everything's on a barbell for me. 
Um, you want to touch on your concept of the financial barbell, kind of the idea of um, identifying this cash flow and then moving it over or earmarking it to fund a priority and, and how you came up with that methodology and why, uh, why it's so important. So the, the, the concept of the, the barbell, just to, if you know what a barbell looks like, you've got presumably weight on both sides and then a bar, bar in the middle. And, uh, and so when I think about the financial barbell we have on one end, our businesses or our job that's um, producing income for us, and uh, we're actively involved in, in that at some level. It's a job we're showing up every day and doing the work. It's a business we're managing and all the different elements and uh, maybe we're adding new businesses. Uh, so that's one side of the barbell. The other side is boring stuff, what I, what I call boring, boring stuff, which is uh, more of your, your passive and portfolio income. So if we're looking at the, the revenue multiplication pyramid that we have this is stuff that's at the at the top of the, the top of the pyramid and so the idea is that we want to run two races to the extent possible we want to try to grow our our businesses and that potentially within that uh, bundle of businesses whatever your portfolio looks like uh, there is a potential home run within that that overnight, uh, quote unquote, the overnight success, but eventually you can sort of cash out and fund your core capital, the amount of money that you need to re retire. And so eventually that happens. Maybe you, you do um, grow the business enough that when you sell it, the value is such that, that uh, you're done. You don't have to work anymore. And, uh, and so oftentimes I find business owners hyper, hyper focused on that. I'm going to get to a hundred million dollars I hear that's for whatever reason the most common when I ask people what their their goals are the most common thing I want, oh, I want to have a hundred million dollar business and they're all in on that but we're missing the boring stuff the passive and portfolio income that can be getting us a consistent uh, rate of return relatively consistent and risk adjusted so we got a lot of risk usually over on the businesses and we're trying to eliminate that to the extent possible, but we can't, we can't get it to zero because we have competitors and the economy and we have all these sort of things that are happening that, um, that create new risks and the rule of three and 10, you know, every time we triple our business or hit an order of magnitude of 10, everything breaks. So we have this dynamic, dynamic complexity <clears throat> existing on our business side of things. Uh, and so ideally we have some consistent income that's going to, going to grow over, over time. So that's <laughs> passive and, and portfolio, portfolio being stocks, bonds, um, things like that, alternative investments. Um, passive could be um, things like affiliate arrangements, revenue shares, uh, joint ventures, thing, things like that. And so the exercise is to uh, Basically, anytime we optimize our business and we find some additional cash, cash, so we fully, so these, so we fully funded our reserves, and talk about how we want to have a reserve for uh, salaries, a separate reserve for uh, operating expenses, and then a separate reserve for investments. And we want these in separate accounts. Why? Because there's something called the mental accounting bias, and I'll later throw a link in there for a couple minute explainer video on how there's some real neuroscience behind how simply separating your accounts into separate buckets will allow you to make better economic decisions. Not doing that usually causes us to consistently violate uh, pretty basic economic uh, principles. So we want to have these separate accounts, fund those, uh, and uh, based off pre-prescribed rules that we have. But then as we have find extra money through optimizing, we want to take that money and bring it over to the boring stuff. And the reason why, I, and I can show some like fun with numbers, Nick, if, if you think that's valuable. Yeah. We're also, we're going to get into two Oreo Augusta and, and a real world example. Um, 
So whenever it is appropriate to show fun with numbers, then please do. Okay. Yeah. If you want to just make me the host again, there is yep. So the great thing, and I talk about the barbell all the time while I get Dan set up here, is is the benefit because I think I think the home run swingers might fail to see the uh, the benefit sometimes is that you maintain the upside because you're still tinkering in your your companies, right? You're still swinging for those home runs, uh, but just systematically moving the the extra over to something reliable. So just in case you don't hit a home run, you still have something kind of accumulating over there. Um, so you see the future value calculator. Yep. So this is just a free calculator online. I just Googled future value um, and I found this. So uh, the ideas of future value and present value are really the underpinnings of the whole discipline of finance. And it's this idea that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Nick, would you rather me give you, pay you now or wait and pay you later? I think it depends, right? Okay. So if I paid you $100 now or I paid you $100 a year from now, you'd probably rather have the $100 today. Mm -hmm. And the, the assumptions that go into that is that, well, uh, presumably if I have $100 now, I could invest it. And that could be back in my business or uh, in something else. And I'm going to get some rate of return. And or because of inflation, as time goes on and things can become more expensive, that hundred dollars is just worth less. So I'd rather have it today than, than tomorrow. So future value is just basically going, um, if I invested some money now, what will it turn into later? And so what this tool does is it, it goes, okay, give me the number of periods. In this case, we're talking years, but periods could be months, could be days. And so you gotta be consistent about um, the, the frame that you're looking in. But let's just say uh, that through optimization, we find an additional 20,000. And so each year we're gonna have an additional $20,000 of cash and for the next 10 years. And we're going to invest it. Historically, the S&P has received a 9.8% uh, rate of return. So we got 20,000 that we found that we're gonna invest now. And then every, every day for or sorry, every year for the next 10 years, we're going to invest the additional 20 grand. So what is that going to turn into? 366,000. Okay. Uh, what if we did it for 20 years, right? And this is the fun with numbers that we got 1.2 million. And what if we did it for 30 years, then we have 3.5 million. Well, oftentimes that savings that we might find is more like 50 grand. And so, and so through the combination of a lot of the tax optimization stuff. And so if you're consistently taking that 50 grand and putting it aside into something boring, it turns into a real number, right? And so the idea, um, and, uh, and not like a necessarily a, a, a mind blowing thing per se, but the idea is that we wanna run two races. We wanna find some extra cash and put it into boring stuff that we don't wanna think about so that we're hedging the downside, the potential that our businesses don't ever have a home run. Uh, and so we just want to automate and make that boring. And uh, eventually you probably have someone who helps you kind of manage that to make sure you're getting 9.8 or more on a risk adjusted basis. So not all 9.8% are created equal. You could take on a ton of risks to get 9.8% or you could take on little risk potentially. Ideally you take little risk to get that return right. So not all 9.8s are created equal, um, but we wanna carve out the, the cash that's just sitting there is being lost, uh, potentially being paid to government agencies and stuff because you hadn't done the proper planning. Put that aside into the boring stuff, assuming we funded our reserves. And then because it's automated and boring, we don't need to think about it. Then we focus on our business or businesses and finding that, that home run where we fund all of our core capital, core capital, the amount of money we need where we don't have to, to work anymore. We have financial support. So it's both. And too often what I see folks doing is just one of them. And that's gambling. It's just straight up gambling, which is I'm hoping I'm gonna hit uh, jackpot enough times that I'm, I'm done. And uh, that may happen. Or of course we know all of the horror stories of folks who 
are, end up have been running businesses for years and are in their 50s or 60s and they don't have anything to show for it. Uh, we've had some equity deal conversations for folks who are in those exact positions where they continually just invest it back in their business over and over and over again. And, um, and uh, the value just isn't there for them to be able to cash out. So it's an, it's an and, not an or. Let's, let's do both, basically. So that, that's the concept of the barbell. The reason why I came up with, with it uh, is we were doing a lot of, well, two, a year and a half ago, maybe, I, was, I spoke at a CFO conference and I heard a bunch, there were 300 or so other accounting firm owners who were there. And uh, what I had observed, I was, uh, I, what I observed from going and being there was that we were no longer sort of the firm, the only firm doing tax planning, um, that hundreds of firms were now doing tax planning. Um, but there was still a big gap in what was going on, which is that the, the strategies uh, didn't necessarily leave their clients better off at the end of the year. It's like, I saved you all this money, but their clients, they couldn't demonstrate that their clients were better off at the end of the year because their clients either didn't execute on the strategies, which is a whole other discussion. Uh, that's part of it. But also because the money was already in their account. They didn't generate more money, the tax savings, and a lot of the like, strategies that we talk about. It's already there. It's about making sure that money actually gets carved off and allocated appropriately. And if it's just sitting in one account, it all gets spent, goes away, gets lumped in. That's the mental accounting bias. And again, I'll drop in the, the, the link where uh, you can do all the great planning and so on and so forth. If the money gets spent, you're in the same exact position. And if anything, you might be worse off because you paid for planning and strategy. Uh, and so you paid that expense and you have the same, you're in the same cash flow position you were in to begin with. So that's, um, and, and that's why I call it uh, a wealth lever because it, it's so simple. And um, basically what was just shown was um, you can take $50,000 a year. If we could find it, that's step one, move it over to where it gets reallocated or earmarked so we can't touch it. And in 30 years, you're looking at 8.4, 8.5 million dollars. So even if you don't hit your home run, you got eight million dollars sitting there. Or if you do, you got eight million dollars sitting there. Um, and exactly. I think what we can do, just based on what I've, I've had this time I spent with you, and I've seen, I think we can get people 25, 50, maybe 100 percent of the way there um, with two simple strategies that are, you know, Dan always has great names for everything. Um, so drop a comment or in the chat, if you say, hey, look, we'll share this with you, show you what to do with it or, or how to, to, the steps to take uh, if you're actually going to do it. Like one person tells me they're going to do it, I'll put my slides back up and walk you through it. Yeah, Nick, and if you take the, if you take the fun with numbers thing I was showing and you flip it from 30 years when it was at 8.4 8 and you go to 40 years, that number goes to 23 million. So we're talking about 30 years. That would put me at, that would put me at 60. Um, and, and what we're going to show if, okay, Will said he'll do it. So Will, we're going to share this with you. I want to hear that you've done it. And I want, I've shared the results. I, bro, I have a direct mail newsletter. I actually did this and I step-by-step step shared exactly what I did and all the numbers and everything. So we'll, uh, we'll share that with you if you'll do it. And we're talking about 30 years of, you're going to see uh, the most powerful part is it's not like uh, live like a hermit, you know, you don't have to live like a hermit and, and sell, 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 sell all day so that in 30, 40 years you can enjoy it. Yeah. 100%. This isn't, this isn't about like you need to, I guess, go on the, the, <laughs> the rice and beans sort of uh, thing that, that uh, I'm blanking on his name. 
but there's there's a finance guy out there. I don't know, uh, necessarily disagree with everything that he says, but part of it is just going from it's the Dave Ramsey. Thank you. It's it's uh it's the idea of you go from chaos to extreme rigidity. Well, the problem is is that most folks who go to extreme rigidity go back to chaos eventually because the rigidity is not sustainable. And so uh, this is about uncovering things, automating it, making it easy. It's not about you need to be a hermit and uh, sacrifice like joy and pleasure. That's the exact opposite of what we're about. Every action that we're, we're, we're taking needs to be getting us closer to the things that we want, not further away. And we have to call spades spades. Like there's just so much neuroscience out now about how being too rigid will lead you back to chaos. It's just there's just too much data of it. Um, and it shows up in many different disciplines. All right, let's um, hit the hit the strategies, questions, drop them in the Q&A. If you have, um, I see questions coming in the chat, drop them in the Q&A. We'll circle back to that at the end to make sure that we get through the, the steps here. Uh, the first one is, uh, if I can have she screen share access, I'll, I'll share the name, is the two Oreo principle. So I'm going to let Dan share it. But as you're watching this, um, make a commitment to do this. It, it's, it, I'll give you my numbers. It was 2,200, here over 2,200 a month, which ends up being $1.3 million in, in uh, 20 years, whatever math I did. Um, so uh, Dan's going to share tutorial principle, how to think about it, how to recognize it, some quick tips on how to implement it, and then um, automate it and make sure this, when you do this, getting earmarked, earmarked and move over. And I just want to say that Will says, thank you on behalf of my kids. Uh, that's meaningful to us. So thank you for sharing, for expressing that. Yeah, 100%. Okay, so a little backstory on the two Oreo principle. Well, one, I like coming up with principles that have fun names just because uh, it becomes more memorable. If it's just some boring finance finance term, uh, it's like, it's just hard to remember. So the, the, the backstory is that uh, a couple years ago I moved and uh, my family, we moved homes to our hopefully for, forever home. I say hopefully because I hate, uh, I hate moving and uh, packing and all that. Uh, and I'm one of those folks who uh, I definitely struggle with the like rigid chaos or I can, uh, particularly in the, in the, the like snacking variety. So I've got a, a, a tendency that if I know about where the snacks are, like I'm eating all the snacks until they're, they're gone. And uh, my wife is one of those folks who she's just, when it comes to snacks, it's like she just eats one piece a day. And sometimes I look in the cabinet and I'm like, this is expired because like there was something yesterday that I threw away. It was like one of her candy snacks that was expired because she just has like one piece here or there. I'm I'm like eating the bag basically over like over a couple of days and probably making myself sick and uh, knowing that's going to happen. So when we moved, uh, so it, before we moved, I was intentional about like I don't want to know where your your snacks are because I will end up eating them. And so, but when we moved. Uh, basically, I uh, figured out or found where the where the snacks were, and uh, the relevance of that is near the end of the year. I re was trying to think about how did I how did I put on like 10, 10 pounds? Like, was, am I exercising much differently? Is my uh, is uh, my diet does it change very much? Like, I don't think so. And then I started thinking about it. I was like, you know what? I think I've been eating like the equivalent of two Oreos a day. Uh, of course, I was doing them more like eating a package of them and then like a week later eating another package or whatever. But it was averaging out to like an additional two Oreos a day. So I looked at the calories and uh, if you do two double stuffed Oreos, which let's be honest, that's what I'm doing. I'm not doing the single stuffed. Uh, Two double stuffed Oreos is 140 calories. And so if you ate two Oreos a day and you didn't do anything else differently, than if you just ate two double stuffed Oreos a day, 
every day for a year, that's 51,100 calories. And if there's 3,500 calories in a pound, then you're, you're gaining basically 14.6 pounds. And so what's, what's the point? It's not to shame anybody about their snacking habits, but uh, on the surface, adding two Oreos to my diet seemed, did, seemed completely inconsequential. They're not that big. Uh, I didn't put much thought into it, right? Uh, but the idea is that these seemingly small things, two Oreos, actually compound into something that is major, right? And so having to lose 10, 15 pounds is not something that can just be done overnight. That's gonna take weeks uh, to do and, and discipline and all of that. But something small, two Oreos turns into something significant. So that's the idea, the two Oreos principle is that something small turns into something significant. And the, the application is that when I look in my books on occasion, because I do this once a quarter, when I look at clients' books, what I see is they have all these little Oreos that they're ignoring, basically. It's the software as a service stuff that you signed up for that you haven't used in months, years. Uh, and they just keep charging every month. It's like the gym membership and you're like, I haven't gone to the gym in two years but I'm still paying LA Fitness every month. Or I got a Peloton and I uh, haven't used it in months, but I'm still paying the $50 a month. Uh, or it's, I've got four different streaming packages, but I'm only using one. Like these, are, these are more personal examples, but within businesses, there's usually just a, a wide range of stuff that got set up and isn't being used anymore. Uh, or you're on the two, exp you're on a plan, like you've upgraded at some point to the premium plan, and then you never downgrade it. It's like, oh, I want to do a webinar on Zoom, so I'm going to upgrade, but now I haven't done a webinar in, you know, a year, but I'm still paying the, pr the premium plan. And the trap that people get in is the same trap that I got in with the two, like gaining the 10 pounds from the two Oreos, which is like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. My time is too valuable to spend dealing with with this. Like it costs me too much to, you know, deal with canceling this, this uh, $14 charge, $15 charge. But that $15 turns into $180 over the course of the year. And all these little one-off charges. So usually when we do this with folks, I mean, the most that we found was someone was 30,000 a month. For not even a massive business, there's a couple, this is like a, uh, maybe a $3 million a year in revenue business, three to four million. Uh, and they had 30,000 a month in just recurring charges of things they weren't, weren't using. So that's a more extreme scenario. Oftentimes it's 500 to 3,000 a month in these expenses for things that people are no longer using or could be, could be downgraded. So uh, here's the process to do this. Uh, and it's a bit of a mental model shift to go from opting out to opting in. So both requ require energy, right? It requires energy to opt out or requires energy to opt in. Uh, and so I'd rather have to spend the energy to opt into something bad than have to spend the energy to opt out of something bad. Does that make sense, Nick? Yep. Because uh, we're avoiding, we're playing the game of avoidance. We're avoiding the time to opt out. But I'd rather avoid the time to opt in to something that's going to be bad. Right? One is just happening to me uh, because I haven't invested in opting out. Uh, I'd rather rig the game in a way that um, if I avoid it, that's a net positive for me. So there's, there's a couple ways to do this. Uh, and just by the way, on the opting in, I mean, this is how I try to design pretty much everything, whether it's, I'm spending too much time on Facebook, so I'm gonna change the password to something random with 25 characters, and I'm gonna sign out of everything. Because in order for me to get back in, it's gonna take me 10 minutes, five minutes, and hopefully in those five or 10 minutes, there will be a pattern interrupt where I'll be like, why am I doing this? Like I've now had to get a, 
the password reset code and uh, to my email and then the multi-factor authentication text and why uh, hopefully I'm able to uh, interrupt myself. So it's about having to opt back in rather than opt out, which is just have the willpower to not get on Facebook anymore, just as an example. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, first go see, do I have any debit cards or credit cards where I can just click a little button where I move the card to locked? Just locked. A Capital One credit cards, you can lock the card, meaning someone can't charge, charge the card anymore. Uh, if I don't have that as an option, I'm going to uh, get my card reissued. So I'm not gonna close out the account. I'm just gonna get a new card reissued. Most vendors, there are a few that can still charge you with a new card, but most vendors, if you get a completely new card issued, uh, won't be able to process your card. And so what happens is, is that you start getting a bunch of alerts, right? Now all these, these uh, vendors who you haven't really heard of are like, hey, you need to pay us, what's going on? You're like, hey, I, you haven't been reaching out when I have not been using your platform for the last two years, but it's nice to hear from you now. Uh, so you're gonna start getting all these emails. Some of them are gonna be things that are charging you monthly. Uh, some of them are like quarterly or annual. Like I've had these things happen where you buy something and uh, you sign up and you pay one time annual. Like on your, like that's especially the case when you buy stuff with the app store where you start getting you know, these one time annual charges and they just auto, auto renew really with, often with no notice. And so it's not just gonna be the monthly stuff, but it's also gonna be these annual charges that uh, you completely forgot about. And those end up being the bigger ticket items where it's, it's say Dropbox renews, you haven't really been using Dropbox and there's an $800 charge for something you're not using. Well, they're not gonna refund you that money. Um, you know, their policies prevent that. So either um, cancel the card, uh, or sorry, cancel and reissue, lock it. Um, there are some tools now that you can use uh, where you can get kind of unique one-time uh, one-time codes uh, for cards so that, that uh, if you do a one-time annual charge, they can't charge you again because that card was just for one unique transaction. Uh, but that requires doing that on the front end uh, when you purchase whatever it is initially so that doesn't help you now, that just helps you potentially in, a f in the future preventing. Uh, that's an added step. I would just lock my card or reissue. And then what you're doing is opting back in. So uh, if Netflix is something you use all the time, guess what? Uh, at some point they're gonna say you can't use Netflix anymore until you update your card. So you're gonna opt back in for that and give them the card. But there's gonna be a bunch of stuff that you're like, cool, close my account. I'm not actually using it anymore. And uh, I had one, we set up a week, a wiki for internal like tracking of stuff. And, the, and so we had an internal team wiki and we migrated at some point to something else. And for the life of me, we could not get this thing canceled. It was like $40 a month, but uh, emailed, called, they just kept charging our card. And uh, so, we reissued and uh, they sent us warnings for like three months each time. They're like, this is the last warning we're gonna send you. We're gonna close your account. I would respond like, thank you, please close my account. We've been trying to close this account for months. And, uh, and then a month later, it would like resume. And with the messaging of like, hey, you know, another month has gone by, we're gonna close your account. So some of it, uh, you're gonna get a lot of emails. I find that like it's, it's entertainment for me, <laughs> I guess. I'm like, uh, I just sort of chuckle about the, the stuff uh, companies following up uh, that have made it really difficult for you to cancel. Yeah. And so then do it, uh, I do it basically once a quarter because there's stuff that gets added by my business partner, other people on the team, team members leave, um, and stuff that they had signed up for. And uh, usually it's 500 to a thousand bucks that we find of stuff that got added that um, can, be, can be turned off. 
and you just take that savings and you either reallocate it to investments within your business or you or you kind of replenish your reserves or you take it and you move it to, to boring stuff. That's the, I found a, I had a client who uh, found $50,000 a month. Expenses were 110 and went down to 60. So it's, it's, it, it can be significant. The, the internet marketer, I think that's probably, they probably have way more of those two Oreos floating around. I mean, 50 grand a month. They go from like, I need to double, they probably went from my, I would need to add a hundred grand in revenue. I want to get to 200,000 to, I can now fund all of my goals without growing anymore because mm -hmm. I just cut out 50,000. Yep. That's crazy. So you find the, the Oreos and then again, the key is uh, to actually move them somewhere. So I set up as soon as I, I didn't cancel my cards. I sat down and uh, cause I wanted to get all done in the day yep. and just eliminated it, did the math, set up an auto transfer. And um, that's that. The beautiful thing is, which we'll talk about shortly is um, quality of life didn't change. I didn't, I'm not on the, the beans and rice diet to make that happen. Yeah. So that's a cash flow engineering example, which is, is one of the one of the master classes that Dan just taught first time anybody's been um, introduced to that uh, intellectual property. There's a cash flow engineering example. There's a ton. I, I don't remember how many there are. Um, but there's also the tax optimization roadmap, which you're teaching now. And so I think there's 60, there's 60 or more. I know you sent me a spreadsheet. There's over 60 strategies um, that act in the same way in uh, increasing cash flow by not having to pay it out, right? And my favorite, it's another one that you've shared publicly before, is the Augusta loophole. Uh, my assumption is uh, almost anybody listening can can utilize this. Uh, some people have probably heard about it and have not, myself included. I actually have not um, taken advantage of it yet. <clears throat> I want to break down the Augusta loophole and where the money is sitting there. Yeah, this is sort of a low-hanging fruit um, strategy that uh, I think a lot of the, the folks pushing planning are talking about more now. Um, it goes back to basically Augusta, Georgia, where the Masters Golf Tournament is played. So if you don't know, there's something like 200,000 people who live in Augusta, Georgia. And for the Masters Golf Tournament, there's somewhere around 200,000 people who come in pre-COVID, of course, always the, the, the caveat now. And so there's just this massive population swell. And consequently, a lot of folks will rent out their homes. And they'll rent their homes out for, for what I understand to be a pretty significant sum of money uh, because of the fact that it's just supply, supply and demand and also the nature of this tournament, sort of the preeminent professional golf uh, event. And so... Through uh, good lobbying efforts, basically there's this, uh, this loophole, this exclusion that says that if you rent your home out for 14 days or less, your primary residence, 14 days or less, it's completely tax free. And so it doesn't matter how much you collect. So if you're someone in uh, Augusta, Georgia, and you maybe rent your, you got a home, you maybe rent it for 30 grand a night, as long as it adds up to 14 days per year, it's tax free. People who rent out their homes for like Hollywood movies, for example, that maybe charge huge sums of money, they could do it for 14 days or less, and it would be uh, again completely tax tax free. So that is the that is the rule. The idea is to make it uh, easier on the taxpayer uh, because having to deal with a rental property can be kind of onerous, and there's several lay layers, and effectively. Uh, need to hire a tax preparer to uh, usually work through with depreciation and all this sort of stuff. So that's the reasoning for the rule. Uh, the exception is that if you're a corporation, S corp or C corporation, then you can use this in a business context. And the business context could be that uh, the business could rent the home from you. So the business pays you rent. The business takes a tax deduction and you receive the cash. That cash is tax-free to you as long as it's for 14 days or less. So it's basically a way to, uh, as a shareholder, get cash-free money out and also get a deduction on the business side. And so this could be for uh, things like board meetings. 
And so as a corporation, S Corp as well, even if you're a single owner, you may have, you have to approve your reasonable salary, for example. And that really is, if you're uh, maintaining the proper level of documentation, you would have board meeting minute notes for that, uh, where the board, which is basically you approving your salary. So there are, way, so there are board meetings, uh, maybe you have a monthly board meeting to uh, review the performance of the business and, and uh, uh, decide on sort of next steps. So each time you do this, the business would pay you rent. Business takes a tax deduction, it's tax, tax-free money to you. Uh, there is some documentation that needs to be in place for all of this uh, in terms of an agenda of some sort, so what you actually cover, um, as well as ideally a lease agreement between the business or rental agreement between the business and, and you, uh, just documenting ideally an invoice documenting this transaction. The amount of rent that needs to be paid is basically fair market value. What would you pay to rent a local conference room in your area? So the documentation would be to essentially call around and figure out what would it cost me to rent a conference room for half a day or a day. If you're in a major city, that's or most places, a conference room is not a cheap endeavor, you know, one to one to 5,000 potentially uh, at the cost. And so that times 14 days would be the maximum amount that you could uh, take out tax free. So let's say it's $1,000, that would be 14,000 theoretically in tax free money that you could take out in your business. So that's the strategy uh, for most. Uh, and I think tomorrow we're gonna start talking about entity structure in the tax optimization roadmap uh, masterclass. Uh, most businesses that are in the service space where there's only one owner, uh, they're going to make 100000 or more per year. Their S Corp is likely going to be the, the entity structure, in which case this loophole would, would likely apply. And again, go back to uh, the barbell. This, the suggestion, or my suggestion, depending on what your priorities, reserves, all that stuff, which, which Dan covers in cash flow engineering, is be cognizant of what you're doing with that savings. Make sure it's going clo- It's going somewhere, right? Okay, cool. It's tax free. That I mean, it could be tens of thousands of dollars uh, that you don't have to pay in taxes now. Make sure that it is getting reallocated to your funds, and that is the beauty of the financial barbell. Is there's no sacrifice. I mean, you got to downgrade your Zoom that you weren't using anyway. Like the, there's no real sacrifice. Um, it's just increasing cash flow and immediately setting up systems to reallocate to the things that matter to you, your priorities. All right. <clears throat> Again, those two quick examples. I hope everybody on here does them, implements them. Do your two Oreos. Please share it in the group. Let us know what you found. If it's if it's 180 bucks, cool, share it. If it's 5,000, great, share it. Um, and look into the Augusta loophole. Always happy to help. Uh, we're just looking to increase cash flow, not necessarily increase revenue, but increase cash flow and allocate to priorities. And obviously without increasing total risk, which Dan touched on. And so, again, I hope the those two strategies you implement immediately. There are seven more cash flow strategies that will increase cash flow without increasing total risk. Um, it's not in video modules. 14 page, this just got finished today, turned into a 14 page strategy swipe handbook. So you don't wanna watch the videos, we got step-by-step handbook in there. Uh, profit priority methodology, how do you know basically what, what your priorities are and how to fund them? How much is it gonna to cost to, to, to reach this thing that matters so much to you? Foundational wealth principles, um, Dan touched on the rule three and 10. Uh, we touched on two Oreo principle. There's there's a library of these things just sitting right there. Uh, replays of all of these flywheels, both the public ones, the private ones, the Q and A, and everything. So those are all resources available, as well as the cash flow engineering masterclass. So the two Oreo principle is one example, um, but Dan has broken down so many ways to find cash flow sitting in your business right now. Uh, the way you pay your employees, um, a lot of stuff, you know, the variable pay. We've worked through, I've watched Dan work through this with, with a ton of people and find a whole bunch of money sitting there. And 
really, really simple things. It's five training modules, full custom workbook. You can fill this workbook out, get help with it, live support calls. Every Tuesday, every Thursday, we have support calls. Revenue multiplication course. This is adding streams of revenue. Again, six training modules, custom workbook, live support. So again, we're just talking about the ways we can increase cash flow. And now that we know about the financial barbell, we can move it over, reallocate it to, uh, to accelerating or accumulating wealth in a reliable way. Dan alluded to this tomorrow, or that tomorrow, we're continuing the tax optimization roadmap that's being taught live. All 60 strategies, Augusta Loophole is one of them. Um, entity setup, I've seen Dan walk through the entity setup. There's twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 sitting right there for most people, um, especially people that have investments, real estate, and all that stuff. Uh, custom workbooks to figure out which strategies apply. Live support, meaning if you need help working through entity setup, you need help working through how to file this thing or that thing or, or uh, document this thing or that thing. Live support right now. It is every Tuesday, one-on-one -on -one with Dan, um, international. If you're international, Dan has an international tax expert, Kyle, who we can pull on and help walk through that as well. And we want to give them to you as a gift because if you were here last week and the week before, you know uh, that this is indeed a bribe. And I alluded to it before, uh, knowing about these strategies is one thing. We could sell you all the courses. That's great please go buy them. They're very, very useful. Implementing is another. <clears throat> so last week, uh, Tuesday, officially on Tuesday, we launched our brand new diamond membership along with the tax optimization roadmap. That was one of the bonuses that came with it. Weekly live calls. So every Wednesday, we do office hours every Tuesday, every Thursday, we have support uh, for whatever specific masterclass we're teaching or ones that already exist. Uh, custom support. So Wednesday specifically for office hours, which is really one of the best perks of the diamond is you show up. It's not like this. It's not a webinar format. It's a meeting format. And you say, you unmute yourself. You say, Hey Dan, I need help with this. Hey Nick, what do you think about this? Hey Dan, I need help with this. Uh, and we just sit there. If you can ask us any questions about, Hey, I saw you're running this ad or why'd you do things this way? We share it all. And so the question is, walking through two Oreo, walking through Augusta, looking at these 60 tax strategies, thinking about cash flow engineering, uh, how would you like us to help you? Just meet with you every single week and help you work through this stuff, help you make these decisions, and uh, help keep you on track to get closer to things that actually matter. You go to cfeclass.com backslash diamond if you want to check it out. Okay, really quick, real quick pitch. Um, but you can join, get all the cash flow bonuses. So that's cash flow engineering. That's seven steps to cash. That's all the um, all the wealth acceleration frameworks. It's revenue multiplication, full tax optimization. If you go to cfeclass.com backslash diamond, um, you get all of those as a gift for joining. All the details are on the page. Okay, so you can go, go check out the page if you want, cfeclass.com backslash diamond if you have any questions. You can let me know. You can let Dan know. Uh, and we'll hit questions, Dan, if you got time, I'll leave that up in case anybody wants to check it out. Cool. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, actually, Will said he, he canceled the subscription right in the middle of presentation. I love it. He's, he's up to two. It's great. It's an implementer. 600 bucks or so in annual savings at this point. Go, up, go out to a probably have some fun with 600 bucks. So we got a question from Kevin. Um, are you familiar with maximum premium indexing options?